Uh, again, uh, as Jim mentioned, you know, uh, this is a talk about, kind of about a, our early experiences uh, on the mics at TAC. Uh, of course, you now have access to, in fact, the latest hardware that we've been testing. In fact, that hardware was just deployed not too long ago, and we're, we're really at the, the most recent software versions. So uh, uh, you're kind of getting a, a very taste of, of our initial experiences. But um, to set the context for my talk, I want to talk a little bit about the system that we're going to be building. Uh, the system's actually about to begin construction. It's going to be called Stampede. It's going to be a 10 petaflop system uh, in total. Uh, two petaflops uh, conventional cluster. This will be a Sandy Bridge based system. Uh, and then eight petaflops of the uh, uh, Mike coprocessor uh, system. Uh, we do have a five petaflop upgrade planned in 2015. Uh, we'll be adding some additional future versions of the Knights cards. Um, a couple of other little few highlights. We've got 14 petabytes of, of total disk on the system. Uh, it'll be 200 terabytes plus of RAM. Uh, 50, it'll be all FDR InfiniBand. In fact, the, the systems you're on right now have FDR InfiniBand on them. Um, it's going to be about 200 racks of compute hardware, so it's going to be a rather large system. Definitely the biggest system we'll have, have ever built at TAC. And uh, we do plan to integrate some shared memory remote visualization nodes into the system. Uh, we've learned that uh, you know, trying to move data around to various systems to be able to do any post-processing or, or analysis of the data is a bit challenging. And uh, so what we've done is now we've integrated more and more of our uh, other types of nodes into the systems directly so that they connect to the infinite band fabric and access the file systems at high speeds. Uh, and you don't have to worry about transferring the data around. Uh, in fact, a lot of our remote visualization is, is focused on pushing pixels back to the user's desktops. Uh, a lot of our challenges is the users are the last mile problem. Uh, they don't have 10 gigabit going all the way to their labs. Um, you know, usually they'll have 10 gigabit going to their, their universities and then only gigabit into their labs. And so uh, we realize that they can't move terabytes of data around that way. So what we try to do is we just try to push the pixels back to them uh, when they're ready. So, so a few items on the, on the base cluster. So it'll be more than 6,000 nodes. Uh, I can't give you the exact totals just because of you could figure out some numbers on that. Uh, it'll be more than 100,000 cores of Sandy Bridge. So uh, again, we're going to have access to a large number of Sandy Bridge cores initially. Um, these will be dual uh, socket nodes. Uh, they're using the Dell Data Center Solutions custom design. Uh, for those of you who may be familiar with Dell, they have a completely separate division that works on specific customized hardware for Google. Uh, Amazon, and, and what they do is they basically bend the sheet metal custom for you. Um, and typically, the minimum order is 10,000 nodes. Uh, as you can see, we only got 6,000 no pl plus nodes for this system, so uh, we, uh, um, we kind of got a special deal with, with Dell on this. Uh, a few details on the coprocessors. These will be the Intel Mini Integrated Core, which has now been rebranded as the Intel Phi processor, <laughs> Xeon Phi Phi, Phi Phi, um, so Fo Fum. Uh, <laughs> It'll be a special release of the Knight's Corner. So these are pre-production parts that we're going to have uh, in the system. These are not going to be the official uh, G8 cards. These are going to be pre-production release cards. Uh, more than 50 cores, clearly. You've already learned that now. Um, and of course, you're already on the development platforms we have at, at TAC. So uh, we had both a Knight's Ferry cluster and now this Knight's Corner cluster that we're doing uh, testing on and development on. In fact, a lot of the, what I'm going to show you later in terms of the applications is going to be more focused on the Knight's Ferry results, uh, especially since the Knight's Corners we just now are getting up to speed and, and running on. So, so if you take into account all the Knight's Corners and, and uh, uh, the future plus up and everything in terms of cards, uh, we're approaching 500,000 cores of total concurrency on the system. So uh, you know, it's going to be a big deal to be able to handle scaling uh, and, and uh, uh, be able to run it on lots of cores simultaneously. So, um, I mentioned a couple of the ad additional subsystems. Uh, we're going to include 16 one terabyte uh, Sandy Bridge nodes. Uh, this is really for those folks that have cases that they can't really distribute uh, and they need access to a large shared memory. Um, a lot of our computational biologists really like these types of nodes. They have problems that require somewhere between 500 to 700 gig and they can fit sync on a single node and they're not nearly as mature in the HPC space as uh, the typical simulation and engineering folks. So uh, a lot of their codes are not MPI based and they're just now picking up MPI uh, um, and a lot of what they've done has been based on threads and, and OpenMP. So. 
Um, 128 of the nodes are also going to have the Kepler 2 class NVIDIA cards in them as well. Uh, this is actually both to act as a remote visualization and also to do some GP GPU computations on them as well. Uh, what's interesting is the nodes will have both the GPU and the mic card in them. So we'll have access to both in the same nodes. Um, a few details about the storage subsystem. Uh, it is using Dell DCS nodes. Basically, what's interesting is, is, is all of the hardware, except for the login and management nodes, is using all the same chassis. Uh, and it's literally, we just plug in, in different sleds into the chassis uh, that Dell has designed in here. And, and they have different form factors of the chassis that you can install. So um, we're targeting about 150 gigabytes of total aggregate bandwidth for the file system. Uh, and uh, it, like I mentioned, it was already more than 14 petabyte of capacity. So we're going to have partitioning of the disks into multiple file systems. Uh, one of our modes of operation has recently has been that we, we like to have a couple of different Lustre file systems on uh, each of the systems, and this gives users access to different things. Uh, number one, we'll usually have a work file system that we have quotas on. Uh, in that case, users can park data there, and if they don't need any high-speed disk access and they just need to stay another quota, they work in that file system. And then we typically have another one we call Scratch, which is, which is our largest, most capable file system and really designed to handle the, the very large amounts of I.O. So. So, of course, with such a system, power and, and cooling is, is really one of the biggest things in the system. So um, the actual compute part of the fabric will be 182 48U racks. So these are actually the little bit taller racks. Um, after we do the upgrade, we'll be exceeding about 40 kilowatts per rack. So um, in, in this case, we wanted to take a less risky design in terms of the cooling. So we're using APC in-row cooling. And uh, the 2015 peak power is going to be 6.2 megawatts. Uh, so, pre pretty, pretty large amount of power to, to, to run the system. So, um, to give you an idea, our current largest system, Ranger, uh, is running about 2.4 megawatts right now. So, of course, to house the system, we had to <laughs> expand our machine room. Uh, we ha we're adding 12,000 square feet of, of new raised floor uh, to the existing machine room. In fact, the original machine room was designed to be expanded because we fully expected to uh, grow. Uh, so basically, they were able to come on, add on to our existing machine room, put up a temporary wall. Um, in fact, that temporary wall is going to be coming down here in about, I think, another week or so after they commission the building next week, or commission the new part of the machine room next week. So um, we're adding about 6.5 megawatts of new power, raising the total IT power to almost 10 megawatts in the center. Uh, if you include in all the cooling and additional chilling equipment that's going to be running, it'll be about 12 megawatts of total power. Uh, uh, for the whole facility. So, um, as I mentioned, we're using the APC in-row cooler hot aisle containment uh, design. Uh, this was chosen more for less risk. It does increase the footprint of, of the system, but it's, it's known technology. It's something we've already deployed. And with the rapid deployment we had to do for this system, we wanted to reduce risk in as many areas as possible. So, um, we are going to replace our existing chillers that have been cooling Ranger with uh, new, more efficient uh, water cooling towers. Um, one of the challenges on our campus where we're located, there was no more chilled water from the central chilling plant. Um, well, the facilities people took this opportunity to say, well, we just need to build another chilling plant on the campus. So uh, we're, we're basically subsidizing a much larger chilling plant that's going to be able to supp supply more of the campus with, with chilled water as well. So, um, a couple of items on the da new data center. Um, one of our challenges is we, we have very we have a different charge rate if we exceed a peak power limit uh, on the campus. Uh, there's an additional surcharge should any day we go over some peak rate for, for the city of Austin. So one of the ways we're going to reduce our peak power is we're going to use thermal storage during the day. Uh, we'll be able to run, uh, turn off the chillers and run on the thermal storage for about six hours during the day. It's a 1.2 million gallon tank, a very large tank. Uh, and I think it's, we about use about 200,000 gallons an hour. Uh, to be able to provide all the cooling. So our plan is basically during the peak, peak of the day from about noon to 6, uh, we'll, we'll run on the thermal storage. Um, and then at night, we'll run the chillers and recharge the thermal storage uh, at that time. So um, We did explore some modular alternatives. You hear a lot about pods and, and, and a lot of these things. And we knew we needed to do a rapid deployment. But we looked at these different facilities. And really, they were not really cost effective uh, at, compared to site built. Uh, the other thing is the university likes to build infrastructure that's going to last a little bit longer than, 
than uh, just you know one system. So we did try to design that we would support multiple systems in this. And um, another nice thing is we were able to leverage the fact that uh, since we're adding some building space and and adding square footage to a building, it doesn't doesn't cost as much as uh, uh, um, once you're already building. It's uh, we we expanded our training facility, so we added another training training room uh, to support the uh, additional activities uh, at TAG. So. Um, this is just a, a quick little diagram of the system. Um, if you look up here to the right where Ranger Longhorn is, is noted, that's our existing machine room. Uh, all of the, the gray portions over here to the left is all the new facilities that they're adding to the... Uh, oh, thanks, Glenn. <laughs> Perfect. Um, so, so Ranger and Longhorn are existing here. This was about uh, 6,500 square feet of machine room. We're adding the 12,000 square foot here. This is the new training room located here. Um, to support everything, we had to install. This is the new chilling towers and, and central chilling plant. Uh, this is the transformer yard to supply all the power. Uh, and this is the big thermal storage tank. Uh, if you notice, the thermal storage tank's about four stories tall uh, in terms of a, of a building. It's actually taller than the, the, the cooling towers. Um, so, uh, um, uh, yeah, so we're, we're pretty excited. It's, uh, it's, it's been a pretty rapid construction process. In fact, they just broke ground last November. Um, in February of this year, they were literally pouring the slab. Uh, so here you can see this is our existing machine room where they had already knocked down and pulled off all the brick off the wall. Um, a month later, they literally had the whole shell in, all the structure closed in. Um, and this is actually the, the current layout of, of the system and the way it's designed. So basically, this is the entire length of the new machine room, all the chill water and supply lines. Um, and the, basically, you have chill water running in down each one of the hot aisles, supplying the in-row coolers between each of the racks. So, uh, um, but that's that's how the layout is. The big big core. These are the big core switches. We'll have eight core uh, InfiniBand switches, uh, FDR switches from from Mellanox. Um, a month later, uh, in April of, of 26, you can see that they're almost done. They had bricked up the entire outside of the building. They still had this big door here to get equipment in and out of the machine room as as uh, they were continuing to construct it. Um, a month later, they had the chilling towers done. You can see the beginning of the thermal storage tank here. Uh, this is the, the central utility plant that they added as well to, to run all the chillers and equipment. And, uh, and then at the same time, this is actually inside the machine room. Uh, about a month ago, uh, the in-row coolers were all in place. You can see these are the in-row coolers with the filters on it. Uh, all the bus ducts and power and everything was installed. Um, the, the nice thing is, is next week we actually get uh, the whole system energized. Uh, it's going to be commissioned. They're doing load testing on it right now. So we've already got chill water circulating. We already have power in the room. And racks of equipment are already arriving. In fact, I, I got a note the other day that 25 pallets worth of equipment had arrived, 20,000 pounds. So, uh, so I'll have some, some fun when I get back. So. Um, just as a comparison, this, is, this was the a rain, Ranger in our existing machine room with some crack units and, and uh, uh, additional facilities. And then this is our new expansion here. Um, this was prior to our change in layout of Stampede. What we did is we actually, we wanted to use this space and leave these rows empty to be able to put equipment in later. So, uh, we do have a UPS as well to, for all the uh, storage equipment. Um, and all the battery banks are located here uh, down in the southern portion of the room. So. So, as part of our transition, and, and we understand that MIC is a new technology, it's going to take a lot of effort to educate and train users for this. Uh, in partnership with Intel, we hosted a highly parallel computing symposium uh, in April 2012. Uh, this was actually an uh, extended prior series from Intel uh, that, that they sponsored. We had 100 plus attendees show up. Um, in fact, we, we actually had to turn away folks because we didn't, didn't, didn't account for how many folks we, we needed to, to, uh, to uh, plan for. We had invited speakers from Intel. Uh, we also had some submitted papers that were peer-reviewed for, uh, for primarily for Mike and a poster session as well. So, um, in conjunction with that, we also had a programming tutorial with about 30 attendees, and we we focused. We didn't have access to Mike at the time for all the attendees, but we we got a couple of 40 core nodes so that we could start doing OpenMP and and uh, uh, vectorization training uh, for those attendees. And we do intend to make this an annual event every April. Uh, so keep your eyes open if you want to come over and, and visit for the next uh, uh, HPCS symposium that we'll have uh, next year. So. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, we should have our system up and running at that time too. So, um, so at the conference, 
Um, a lot of the effort was focused on Knight's Ferry at the time. Uh, most of the people only had access to, to Knight's Ferry's cards. Um, we did have six papers describing their code porting activities. Uh, Enzo is a astrophysics code. Home is a, a weather code. Um, of course, there were some CFD and chemistry codes as well uh, presented there. So um, we also, interestingly enough, had the Invapage group out, and they were talking about their MPI port to uh, the Knight's Ferry card as well. Uh, the, the Invapage team is part of our project for Stampede, and one of the things we'll be doing is, is working with them to, to make sure that we can also support their MPI libraries on our systems. So, um, so uh, um, also we we did have a few tools tool designs people there. So we had the Perf Expert folks and uh, um, and and looking at offload and and uh, CV. All the talks are available online. If you go to our website. Uh, I think there was a subsection, and I think the, the agenda and all the postings for the, t the talks are, are available there. All right, so just uh, I'm going to talk more about on now some of our efforts and our experiences. So uh, uh, for, for our initial Knights Ferry uh, programming experiences, um, first thing was is codes port pretty easily. Um, in fact, I think some of you have already probably taken your codes and got them running on the, the Stampede starter system. I, I talked to a few folks yesterday that said that pretty much most of the stuff compiled right out of the box. Um, that wasn't necessarily true with the first software stacks, um, and it took a little more effort. But you know, it took us literally minutes to maybe days uh, to get uh, all the codes ported and running onto the Knights Ferry cards. Um, and in fact, those that even took days were primarily due to library dependencies. You'd have to build all the various libraries. In fact, uh, I was talking to one of the attendees yesterday about Boost, LibBoost, LibMesh, uh, you know, all these uh, other libraries that are required to build many of the application uh, packages. So um, the de ch challenges, though, is that performance, really to get performance out of these cards, requires some effort. Uh, it's easy to get the codes running on there, but it's important to really look at the performance. Um, and of course, while the silicon continues to evolve, evolve we're, we're still focusing on how to get performance out of these things. Uh, the nice thing is, is that scalability is, is on existing in the early parts was very good. Um, and in fact, I have several examples that show that, that scalability. So, um, to give you an idea, we focused on some of the codes that we use here at TAC. Uh, bioinformatics, atmospheric reentry, uncertainty quantification code. These are actually two projects uh, that, are, that we uh, have researchers at TAC uh, working on. Uh, a little finite element CFD code that was also developed uh, by one of the researchers at TAC, uh, and then a simple lattice Boltzmann uh, code. So the first application was a bioinformatics application. Uh, this is a SNP uh, plant. Um, it's uh, basically a correlation of plant genomes, uh, genes to uh, observables, so that you can correlate the genes to height, size, and plant, plant uh, 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 characteristics. Uh, it's a relatively short code, really only containing one parallel region with about 500 lines, so it's not a very difficult code. Um, but was it, what was nice for us is that basically we saw perfect scaling with the OpenMP because a lot of the data could be held in L3 cache. So, um, but basically this was an old Python code uh, with some R in it that we, we had rewritten to, to speed up as, as part of the iPlant project. Um, and then this was the scaling. So. So uh, on Knights, Knights Ferry, the code compiled right away. Of course, your mileage may vary on that. Um, we ran it directly on the mic. And you can see we had actually almost perfect scaling up to, to 30 cores. Um, and then once you did overloading and ran it all the way out to the 120 cores, uh, you did see that there was some tail off in, in terms of performance. But at least it was still, still scaling pr pretty work. Uh, we do need to do some vectorization work into this product uh, uh, to really get additional speed up uh, out of the application. Uh, C4 was a quantum chemistry code. Um, what was important here is this was like a very long uh, Fortran 77, Fortran 90 code, 1.4 million lines of, of code. Uh, it's an ab initio method, so it uh, was really chosen because you know, we wanted to test the native compilation capabilities on mic, and also because it only needed MKL as its external libraries to be able to compile and run. So. Um, it required only minimal changes to the build system to get it to compile. It took about three hours uh, from start to finish to actually get the code compiled and running on the my cards. Uh, it did use the, the threaded blahs uh, from the math kernel library uh, to support uh, most of its uh, uh, computations. Um, 
The downside is, is this one actually is an out of core method and so it requires a heavy need for I.O. which is not really what we were focusing on for this initial work. So, um, but we're going to look at some future work on offloading the key linear algebra kernels. Um, so we also looked at the MKL offload, so you're going to get a little bit more about this today. Uh, a lot of our folks use Petsy uh, as a base library to build their applications on as well. And so we wanted to make sure that we could build this and run this. Um, and we, we recently tested this against the pre-production MKL on Nice, nice Ferry. Um, and basically it was just a simple matrix matrix multiply that we were testing. But the neat thing was is that we were actually able to get Petsy to compile um, and get some performance results uh, with automatic offloading. So um, what you can see here is, is you get a pretty good speed up. It does tail off once you get beyond the 30 cores or 30 threads uh, up to, the, I think this was run out to 90 threads. Um, there was some overhead with the thread creation, so we also wanted to measure performance without the overhead. Um, and as you can see, you only had 6% overhead for threads of, at four threads, but you, you did have a, a pretty large amount of overhead when you were creating 116 threads with the automatic offload. So uh, something to keep in, in mind. Uh, I think this will improve uh, with the next generations of silicon uh, and so forth. So. Um, we also, FFT is used uh, quite extensively on a lot of our applications, so we also wanted to see how FFT does, uh, and, and specifically we're looking at this in a direct numerical simulation uh, code. Um, what we did is we took FFT W3, 3.3, and compared it directly with MKL, and as you can see, MKL is, is pretty much uh, be able to outperform FFT W3, but we still have a lot of folks who, who build on, on FFT W3, so we wanted to see the performance. Um, and uh, we figured that the, the MKL was actually doing a little bit better because it has the improved vectorization. I have a feeling the FFTW people will probably be doing some work. But you can see that we were able to uh, pretty much, uh, MKL was outperforming sometimes by 2x what FFTW was, was able to do, even all the way out to, to 120 threads. Um, however, it was important to get the affinity right. Um, to get performance out of this. In fact, uh, some of this was discussed yesterday about setting of the, the affinity settings on, on the mini core processor. So um, what we did is we did some baseline results and compared uh, three different uh, affinity settings that were available at the time. I think this was even before balanced was an option, which I think is now an option. So this, the Knights Ferry didn't have this. So we were testing the scatter, compact, and explicit. Um, for these runs, I, I think pretty much uh, we, we saw that uh, uh, scatter provided the most, uh, in general, uh, performance improvements when you're all the way out at the large number of threads. Um, so uh, uh, it's something to keep in mind that you want to test various affinity settings with your application because it, it is going to be application dependent. Um, but yeah, so we had scatter providing the best overall performance uh, in general. Uh, we also did look at the, the scaling of the FFTW uh, um, kernel, uh, and basically we, we based the speed up on four threads, and, and uh, as you can see, the, the MKL has a much better spe uh, uh, performance all the way out to the 120 threads versus the FFTW here. So uh, about 72% scaling efficiency with MKL. Um, uh, switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about finite element code. Um, this was a, a, a code that's been uh, in development for many years now. It's really MPI-based code. It has great scaling uh, on MPI. Uh, however, it doesn't really have any OpenMP available in it. So as the, the developer said, it needs OpenMPification. <laughs> um, it's an element-by-element, element, finite element code. So there's a stiffness matrix formulation. But much of the work is in this, the DGMVs for each element in the Krylov solver. So, so basically, they're looking at doing OpenMP parallel loops over the elements uh, to integrate it to hopefully get some additional thread speed up. But what they wanted to really look at is now, since it, it's really based on DGMV and they had their both op own implementation of D DGMV and uh, compared it with, with MKL. And uh, this was the initial performance that they uh, were, were got. Now, this was a, a pretty naive two loop vector matrix vector, vector product. but. What we were really looking is to see how well the scaling was out to about the 120 threads. Um, now, if you didn't have a big enough problem for MKL, you see that you pretty much flattened out and you didn't get any advantage. But, but with a bigger, bigger problem size, you still got uh, a little bit better scaling up. Um, 
Lattice Boltzmann was another algorithm. Um, we, we, it started with some simple sequential code, so we vectorized this one first. Um, and in fact, you can see that we've got a 4x speed up on Knight's Ferry and only a 2x speed up on, on Westmere uh, once we started to do our vectorization. This was, this was actually what we expected since, since we realized that uh, uh, we, did, we weren't going to get as much advantage with the vectorization. Yes? Make sure the Intel compiler, make sure they have all the vectorization dependencies. Uh, in some cases, uh, you had to put pragmas to make sure that it vectorized certain loops. Uh, it did take some changes in some of the loops to get rid of some dependencies so that you, we, we could vectorize it. So uh, that's what I meant when I, I, I said vectorization on this. So um, They also added OpenMP on the outer loops. Uh, it's not heavily optimized. Uh, they, they do think that they can improve the, the speed up. Uh, they still have to do a few things here. Uh, they're, they're running natively right now, but they want to do an offload version as well. Um, and of course, there's an MPI-based code, so they want to, of course, do MPI on CPU plus offload uh, of, the, of the distributed version for performance. Again, here they looked at different uh, affinity settings, and as you can see, at, at small thread counts, there's a huge, pretty big difference in the compact and scatter uh, uh, in, in some of the cases. Um, we got pretty good pretty good scaling on the West mirror and then took that out and then ran it. You can see that when you got out to 30 cores, you're pretty good, but then it, it really did start to tail off uh, as you overloaded the, the, the th cores. Um, and then this was in C. Uh, they also did it in Fortran 90 and actually got uh, much better uh, performance results out uh, uh, to uh, almost 120 threads. Uh, so you can see it does flatten out though. So just to summarize, uh, you know, the, the bit of good news here is that you know, porting of the applications was really reasonably straightforward, didn't take a whole lot of recoding of the applications. Most of the effort was re really rewriting the build scripts, the make files, uh, all of the pieces to add in the right options. So uh, we focused a lot on Fortran and C++. A lot of our folks run both types of codes. We need to make sure that uh, you know, we don't leave any of the Fortran developers behind. There's still a large number of them. Um, you know, we did test some serial codes, OpenMP, and thread, thread building block based uh, applications considered. Um, what was important for us is we could see pretty good strong scaling uh, results uh, for some of the kernels. You know, it dropped off when you got over the number of threads available on, on the Knight's Ferry, but it didn't really turn over. It didn't really go down and, and, and uh, uh, you were still getting some speed up as you added more threads. So. Um, the other thing was is we were able to get native compilation for a number of third-party libraries. This is actually important for us. We support a large number of libraries for, for large, the, the various applications that are run on the systems. And so uh, we did want to make sure that we could build these right out of the box, get them running on the mic cards. Um, one thing we did find, though, is that static libraries for the mic were actually more robust than the shared object libraries. Now, I think they've improved this. This is, this is uh, something that Intel's been working on. Uh, with us as well, but w right now a lot of our effort has, has focused on just building static versions of the executables. Um, and since you had to transfer them over to the mic initially to go run them, it was just easier to have a static binary and, and move it over there. Um, of course now with the test system you're on, you actually have an NFS mount of the home file system, so you don't have to worry about copying the binaries around and so forth. And I think some of what, some of the exercises probably were using more shared libraries uh, than, than uh, uh, what was done previously. So, uh, so, so we're seeing more and more uh, support for the shared library. So, um, we, we've had a very positive result on the first and the Knights Ferries mics, and of course now with the Knights Corners that we have, uh, I do want to reemphasize that what you're testing right now is not the final version of the of the Knights Corner. These are these are still the the engineering samples uh, that that are just now available and don't have the full functionality. So. We expect to get a little bit more performance and improvement uh, as the silicon continues to evolve. Um, of course, a lot of our effort now has started to move uh, to our old friend MPI. Uh, everything relies on MPI, and so uh, we, with working with Intel and the latest Intel MPI, we're, we're just now getting into the, to running this on the night corners and, and uh, um, uh, you're trying to use multiple hosts simultaneously uh, to run some of these applications. So uh, with that, I'll go ahead and wrap up.